Hello, everyone. Welcome to our annual Ford Lecture, the poem poetry of Otagaki Rengetsu. My name is Gina Borromeo, and I am the Senior Director of Collections and Curatorial Affairs and Senior Curator of Ancient Art at the Walters Art Museum. I would like to begin by stating that the Walters Art Museum acknowledges the Piscataway and Susquehannock nations that originally inhabited this land. We also acknowledge tribal nations, most notably the Lumbee, who migrated here, and indigenous peoples whose ancestors are represented in the objects we steward in our collection. Today's lecture is the 28th annual Ford Lecture. It is generally, generously sponsored by John and Bert Ford. In addition to giving the Walters a major collection of South and Southeast Asian art, they have endowed an annual lecture series. I am delighted to welcome our guest speaker today, Dr. Melissa McCormick, a leading expert on East Asian art and literature. She is the Andrew W. Mellon Professor of Japanese Art and Culture at Harvard University. Her books, including Tosa Mitsunobu and the Small Scroll in Medieval Japan, 2009, and The Tale of Genji, a Visual Companion, 2018, and numerous articles in both English and Japanese expand the scope and methods of examining and interpreting literary artifacts. She has lectured around the world, including guest professorships at the University of Campinas in Brazil and the University of Zurich. In 2019, she co-curated the Metropolitan Museum of Arts International Loan Exhibition, The Tale of Genji, a Japanese classic illuminated, which was named one of the top five exhibitions that year by the Washington Post. Her research on illuminated manuscripts extends into the history of the book and is featured in her free online edX course, Japanese Books from Manuscript to Print. Today, we are also joined by ASL interpreters, Christina Miranda and Jenny Blake, who will be switching on and off throughout the program. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge that free admission to the Walters Art Museum is made possible through the combined generosity of individual supporters, foundations, corporations, and grants from the city of Baltimore, Maryland, Baltimore, the Maryland State Arts Council, citizens of Baltimore County, and Howard County Government and Howard County Arts Council. So, um, Melissa, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. First, I would like to extend my thanks to Berta and John Ford for their generous sponsorship of this lecture and for Ani Proser and the Walters Art Museum for the honor of the invitation. I would also like to express my gratitude to Danny Chen and Paloma Feliciano and the entire Walters staff for so graciously accommodating my schedule and the Zoom format of this lecture. I'm delighted to be able to talk with you today about the remarkable work of the Japanese Buddhist nun, Otagaki Rengetsu. Rengetsu is one of the most, if not the most, famous women artists of pre-modern Japan. Her work has been collected all over the world, and she has been the subject of numerous exhibitions outside of Japan, from a major show at the National Gallery of Australia in 2007 to several shows in the United States. In the few last years, last few years, her work has been featured in the Herbrush exhibition at the Denver Art Museum, alongside that 20 female artists active during the Edo period at the Ackland Museum in North Carolina, and in an exhibition planned at the National Gallery of Asian Art in Washington, DC, which became an important publication on Dengetsu and the artist Tomioka Tessai, published in 2023. And a work in her style found its way to the Walters Art Museum in 1878, perhaps the earliest instance of Rengetsu Ware appearing in a collection in the United States. Today, I would like to use this diminutive teapot in the Walters collection done in the Rengetsu style 
as a springboard for introducing a range of issues to be discussed during the talk. Let's begin by taking a close look. As you can see from the dimensions, the pod is small, only 12 centimeters in height, and that includes its tall handle. A creamy white straw ash glaze covers all but the base, which has been formed with a mold in the shape of a lotus leaf. This is especially apparent when the vessel is turned upside down. There we find emulated in clay, the prominent veins that run through lotus leaves that provide the plant with structure and support. One of the most remarkable features of lotus leaves is their water repellent surface. The tiny microscopically small bumps which trap air and prevent water from sticking to the leaf seem to be evoked here by the rough nodule laden texture of the clay. The center of the clay leaf with its four dots seems more reminiscent of the seed pod at the center of a lotus flower, but it makes the association unmistakable. While lotus leaves are a brilliant green color, the earthy brown of the unglazed leaf base here perhaps evokes the well-known admiration for the lotus. Its contrast between the muddy environment in which it grows and the pristine beauty of its flowers. The image underscores the idea of transcending impurities and reaching a higher state of consciousness. Such ideas are not far from the surface, or to be more precise, they are on the surface of this vessel in the form of a waka poem incised into the body of the pot, which I have translated as, the dust of this world, may it be swept away on and on for thousands of years by the pine winds of this hermitage. The poem is one of Dengetsu's most well-known verses and its use of the phrase dust of this world speaks to the mundane earthly realm and the clearing away of impurities through the wind in the pines. The hermitage or yado in the poem is suggestive of Dengetsu's own living quarters, but it is also metaphorical for the body or the mind for delusional thinking being brushed away. The poem could also be seen as a generic kind of well-wishing, a blessing <clears throat> purifying the space in which the tea is being prepared. While the sound of the wind in the pines can be likened to that of the boiling water and the stream of steam coming from the pot being released. What I'm most interested in delving into today, however, is what happens to a poem? What happens to the reading of a poem when it is inscribed on a ceramic vessel? In this case, there are ways in which the form perfectly complements the verse. The earthy base resembles the earthly dust, chidi, the pure white on top, the aspirational flower of the lotus. Dengetz's poetry is virtually all in the form of waka, that is, the classical Japanese verse form that consists of 31 syllables. If the waka poem has a rhythm, how does it change or coincide with the shape of the vessel? Does the ceramic itself have a rhythm or a temporality to it? To the extent that a ceramic can and should be held and rotated and moved through space to be appreciated, it does have a temporality. The inscription of a waka poem on the vessel, however, seems to circumscribe time, to give the vessel a direction, a beginning and an end, a narrative even. During the talk today, I would like to show you a few more examples of Dengetsu's poem pottery to explore these ideas of the reading and rhythms of poetry on ceramics. I would also like to speak about a framework for considering the unique kind of materialism and embodiment in Dengetsu's work, a reciprocal embodiment that involves not only the maker of the vessel, but whomever encounters it. I'll begin by briefly telling the story of how this teapot made its way to Baltimore, and then take you back to where and why it was made, giving you some information on Dengetsu historical context, and then focusing on ceramics themselves. The teapot is currently on display in the galleries of the Walters Art Museum, and has been displayed very thoughtfully among cases that demonstrate 
the variety of objects used in making and drinking tea in Asia and around the world. Conveniently, the display includes a case with vessels for chanoyu, um, the drinking of powdered and whisked tea on the left. The variety of ceramics that one might find in a tea ceremony or chanoyu gathering in Rengetsu's day are here, from earthenware daku, uh, an earthenware daku tea bowl to imported ancient ceramics from China and Korea, to the appealing painted ceramic of Ogata Kenzan and the blue and white porcelains made in Japan. Dengetsu made wares for chanoyu as well, including tea bowls and accoutrement for the gathering from flower vases to sake decanters and cups and plates for serving food. In many ways, however, it was the tremendous popularity of sencha or brewed loose tea in her day that fueled the market for her pottery and her creativity. Sencha was introduced from China to Japan and became widely popular after the 17th century. Sencha ceramics thus took the shape of Chinese wares used for the process. The Sencha ceramics of her contemporary Aoki Mokube, for example, were especially prized. And you can see an example of his work here in white. But more often, his wares were vibrantly colored and even playful. The culture of Sencha was decidedly Sinocentric and it provided a social platform for all of those interested in Chinese culture, painting, literature, philosophy, and politics to converse and commune over Chinese or Chinese inspired artifacts. At the same time, Sencha was less formal than reified forms of Chanoyu that had developed over the centuries, leading to a more relaxed, kind of intellectual salon for the exchange of ideas. I'm showing you this slide to give you a sense of the contrast between Dengetsu style works and other pieces made for Sencha, which as you can surmise from these images were prized for their virtuosity and precision and charm. The pot in the center has an inscription in Chinese of Lu Tong's Song of Tea and this serves to contrast as a contrast with Nengetsu's unique approach. She inscribed her vessels not with Chinese characters or Chinese verses from Chinese literature, but with Japanese poems, the waka, as we have seen. And every pot that she inscribed and every verse she used was one that she composed herself. For now, I would just like you to keep this contrast between the Chinese inscribed kind of pristine porcelain vessel with that of Dengetsu. The display in the museum also shows the diversity of objects that were used in the 19th century and the kinds of ceramics collected by William and Henry Walters at the turn of the 20th century. All but a couple of, all but a couple of the pieces were in fact purchased by the Walters. William Walters purchased the Dengetsu style teapot while he was in Paris for the Exposition Universelle in 1878, a panorama of which you see here. As William Johnston explains in his book on the Walters as collectors, the businessman and art dealer, Wakai Kanesaburo, whom Walters already knew from the Philadelphia Fair the year before, was his main entree to Japanese art in Paris. Wakai had set up shop with his business partner at the instigation of the new Meiji government, which was systematically attempting to position the Japanese nation as a respected competitor on the world stage of international fairs. Here you see the invoice of the likely purchase of the teapot dated to July 26, 1878. It includes 129 objects itemized by the Japanese company of, of Messrs. Wakai and Matsuo from the shop on the fancy Boulevard de Capucine, seen here in the famous Monet painting, um, for a total of $2,752.50. And I thank Danny Chen, Associate Curator of Asian Art at the Walters, for tracking down and scanning the invoice, and noting as well that there is one vessel among the entries that could be the Dengetsu Ware teapot although Dengetsu's name is not attached to the piece. <laughs>
What is interesting here as well is the chronological proximity to Dengetsu's own day and age. Dengetsu had only passed away three years before Mr. Wakai shipped the teapot in her style to Paris. He no doubt believed that a piece in her style would be essential to represent the most well-known types of Japanese ceramics at that moment for his European and American clients. Dengetsu was active as a painter, po poet, and potter for over 50 years after she took Buddhist vows. At the age of 32 or 33, while still a mother to a young daughter, but having experienced the death of three other children and two husbands, she discarded the physical markers of conventional lay femininity. She cut her hair, which would have been one of the main signifiers of her age, gender, and status. And at some point, she fully shaved her head, as seen in this posthumous portrait by her protege, the artist Tomio Gatessai. Tessai also attempts to capture her essence. Her brush is in hand, noting her identity as a calligrapher and artist. And to her side are the tools of her pottery craft, not a full-blown wheel, but a kind of uh, dais to support as she molded her ceramics. And of course, she wears the gray subdued robes that show her identity as a nun as well. Admiration for Dengetsu only grew after her death, and scholarly work on her necessarily must deal with layers of stories, anecdotes, myths that became attached to her over the years. Many of her poems celebrate the imperial reign. They are felicitous in nature, and she was also known to have developed friendships and acquaintances with imperial loyalists at that moment, especially during the later years when the Tokugawa shogunate was being overthrown. This made her a kind of figure who was appealing to nationalist causes in the 20th century, of which the historian needs to be wary. Dengetsu was an imperial loyalist, but this had different connotations in the mid 19th century. And she was above all a pacifist. An emphasis on her identity as a Buddhist nun is also important, but it should be kept in balance with these other aspects of her persona. There are a fair amount of autobiographical texts um, that relate to Dengetsu, close to 1,000 poems and hundreds of letter, letters. The art historian Paul Berry believes there might be thousands of letters in her hands still unpublished. Some parts of her life are therefore well documented, with some parts better fleshed out than others. She was probably born in the Sambogi Entertainment District of Kyoto to a father of samurai status and mother who some speculate was a geisha in the district. Whatever the case may be, she was immediately adopted into the Otagaki family. Her adoptive father had a coveted hereditary position as a head administrator at Chiyongin Temple. Here's a view of that temple and a photo of its grand 17th century Sanmon gate that one passes through to enter the complex. It's truly monumental. It's interesting to imagine Dengatsu growing up, Dengatsu growing up in its shadow, to think of her passing by this temple daily, this gate daily, and it's important to consider the social circles to which she had access. It's worth considering what it meant that she was the adopted daughter of a man with the hereditary position of Bogang or temple administrator, meaning that he oversaw the monks at the temple. It was a fairly lofty position. Dengetsu, at a very young age, was sent away to Tamba province and the Kameyama castle. And this is where people believed that she received an education in several different areas, calligraphy, some say martial arts, and as a daughter of a biological father of samurai status, this would have been appropriate. Then, as you can see from this timeline, she returns home and gets married in 1807. I've put the um, rough dates she was, ages she was, in parentheses next to the date. Her life is famous for the tragic losses she suffered early on. As I mentioned before, she lost three children, um, children at the ages of when she was 17, 19, and 24. 
She divorced her first husband, remarried, then her second husband died in 1823. There is some speculation that she had another son who survived, but who was sent out for adoption before she married a second time. Dengitsu maintains contact with this young man, and it seems she has a vested interest in him, as though she might be his biological mother. So there are traces that am amidst these deaths of her children, she did have one lasting parental relationship. Whatever the case may be, in 1823, after her second husband died, she took the tonsure with her adoptive father and she received the Buddhist name Dengetsu, which literally means Lotus Moon. At the age of 32 or 33 years old then, she became a nun, she donned the black robes, but she was still mother to a young daughter. The family moved to a residence in the complex of Chioning called Makuzuang, and here is a photo of the building, which still ex exists today. It's in this green area, as you can see, with the arrow near the main gate. She lived there for about a decade, and this is no doubt the time when she began engaging in various art forms. As you can see by these final two dates, unfortunately, her six-year-old daughter passed away in 1825, and then her father passed away in 1832. With no family remaining and no um, reason to stay at Xiongying, in fact, she would not be allowed to stay any longer after the death of her father, she began uh, to find different residences throughout Kyoto. And here I um, apologize for the map in Japanese, but it should just, if you're familiar with the Kamo River, it should orient you towards the landscape of, of Kyoto with the red lines showing the location of her, of her residences over the years, which appear on the timeline. So after the death, after she left Xiongin and the death of her father, there was a kind of peripatetic period for her and she acquired the nickname of Hikoshi Dengetsu, someone who's always relocating her residence. One reason often given is that she was so popular and well-known that she was inundated with visitors in an attempt to lead a less high profile existence, she moved around, moving slowly northward into the Okazaki area, into a neighborhood called Shogoing, then Shinshoji, and then for the final years of her life, she lives at Jinkoing on the western edge of the capital, which you can see in the upper left corner of the map. She was invited there by the abbot Wada Gozan, otherwise known as Geshin, who became an important collaborator of hers. In fact, this last decade of her life would be one of the most uh, full flourishing for her artwork. And you can see on this slide as well, a picture of her residence, which um, is still there. If you take the very uh, relatively quick trip up the Kamo River nor into Northern Kyoto, um, you can visit her hut. So although she's presented as someone who's trying to kind of discourage attention and to find solitude and hermitage, she was in fact one of the most active and central figures of her day. She should really in no way be kind of envisioned <clears throat> as being <clears throat> completely solitary. Many artworks and texts survive that show her at least uh, on paper interaction, but definitely social interaction with the whole range of thinkers and artists and creatives uh, of her day. The core of, and she was quite famous in her own time, and the core of her fame and integral nature to Kyoto in the 19th century is her poetry. Dengetsu's poetry was first published in 1840 in a journal issue of poems by the students of her, of her poetry teacher, Kagawa Kageki. She seems to have some, had had some aversion to having her poetry anthologized in a printed publication, but there were two published in her lifetime, the covers of which you can see here from 1868 and 1871. The scholar Sayumi Takahashi Harb has suggested that Dengetsu's deep interest in the material properties of her waka poetry 
how she inscribed it on so many surface material surfaces is what turned her against having her works in print. And to have them, in other words, kind of divorced from their material substrates. Then gets who consistently used the 31 syllable waka as her primary mode of expression. Now this was an ancient form that counted female poets among its earliest and greatest practitioners. Dengetsu left behind nearly 1,000 waka, a number that is multiplied by their repeated inscription on all manner of surfaces, from pottery to poem sheets to hanging scrolls with accompanying paintings, as you can see here. She also employed the phonetic script of kana to record the Japanese language of her poetry. This script was used by everyone, but it was long associated with associated calligraphically with the so-called woman's hand, in contrast to Chinese characters. This generic distinction linked kana to modes of private writing, to waka poetry, and to vernacular narrative tales famously authored by women. Dengetsu's calligraphic style is immediately recognizable. Her thin brush glides across the surface, producing elegant, thin, sinuous curves. Yet they have an incredible tensile strength. The forms are rounded, plump, buoyant, breezy. The lines have much kind of air and atmosphere in between them. The space where Dengetsu's brush enters the graph is sometimes barely discernible. One needs to look closely to see where she slightly pauses, where she lifts the brush from the paper. There are no dramatic radical exit marks of the brush. There are occasional flourishes, linkages between kana, but here each kana phoneme is a distinct graph ready to be vocalized on its own. Now, waka has a syllabic meter of five, seven, five, seven, seven. And there is a kind of debate about how it should be lineated in English translation. There is no set rules for transcribing the, the lines of verse in, in the Japanese form of the waka. There are occasionally some rules of inscription for specific formats that differed across time and contrast, but in general, it's actually unusual for a poet to inscribe a poem in five clear lines the way you would have it in the English translation. So to look at the poem on this fan, we have an English rambling about, no shade in the summer fields, over the thick grasses, looking for drops of dew, a butterfly in flight. And in Japanese, you can see the syllable count of five, seven, five, seven, seven in each line. Dengetsu actually adhered to this separation of five lines in the five vertical columns that you can see brushed on the surface of the fan. The kana are, all of the uh, phonemes of the poem are in the kana phonetic script, except for a single character for grass in the very center of the fan, which you can hopefully see here. In the very middle, it is the character that is at the lower register of the field on the fan. So here, the poet alters the poem in the inscription to an aesthetic or calligraphic meter in inscribing the verse. With the single Chinese character in the middle, kusa, the word for grass, brushed at the lowest register, she creates an imagistic grass horizon line. Above this, we can imagine the butterfly from whose perspective this poem is written, flitting from plant to plant in the other columns of calligraphy, looking for dew, for drops of dew.
it seems reminiscent, of course, of the idea of Zhuangzi, the notion that one should wonder, that he wondered, am I a person who dreamt of being a butterfly, or am I a butterfly dreaming that I am a person? As the poem allows you to sort of change subject position and enter the perspective of the butterfly. So on paper, the poet inscribing her poem has the ability to change the kind of visual meter of the poem in terms of the way how, in how she inscribes it. And this seems relatively straightforward on the poem, I mean, on paper, but what about when it comes to inscribing a poem on a ceramic, when the poem is turned in space and held by the user? Then Getsu became famous for adding her script to her, potter, to her pottery. And she did not invent ceramic inscription, but she did it in a way that no one had done before. She did it in abundance with her own original poems on every shape and size of vessel. Some scholars say that it was the act of writing in clay that shaped her calligraphic style. Inscribing the letters against the resistance of the surface perhaps necessitated a clarity of form. And here I'll just show you the vast range of works that she produced from teapots and vessels to sake bottles and cups. Tea bowls here you can see as well. More unusual items, braziers for sencha, incense burners, lidded pots, hanging flower vases, incense containers, and dishes for sweets and food served during teas. Turning back to our pot teapot in the Walters Museum, we can ask these questions about poetic meter by looking at the poem again inscribed. When it comes to inscribing teapots, Dengetsu seems to create or emphasize a waka meter that makes a clear division between what is called the upper stanza and the lower stanza. In other words, between the 575 half of the poem and the 77 half of the poem. So here she does this by inscribing that upper stanza on the T ceramic beginning to the left of the spout, moving from right to left. She inscribes the dust of this world, yo no chiri o, yo so ni haraete, yukusue no, may it be swept away on and on. And so we turn the vessel and read the poem moving from right to left, and then read the other half of the poem on the other side for thousands of years by the pine winds of this hermitage, and then she signs her name. So she makes a clear break between the two stanzas. And in some cases, the poem then can create, can kind of um, possess a dramatic kind of emphasis, a contrast, between front and back. It's interesting to think about how the poem is begun on this side of the vessel. This might likely be the side that is fake facing the guest in the preparation of the tea. And so this would be the starting point. Here's another example, a small incense burner, which in shape and texture could be called almost primeval in its presentation. The vessel is covered in indentations that lay bare its process of becoming. The hands of the potter pinched the clay between her fingers to form the thin walled rim at top. She shaped the material from inside out and attached the two handles and three legs, leaving their attachment points visible and unsmoothed. In this, into this emphatically handmade clay vessel, she inscribed a waka, which should be antithetical in its connotations to the roughness and lack of polish observed in the vessel. She brought these two disparate aesthetic qualities together in ingenious ways. Here she puns on the function of the incense burner, for example, selecting an apt verse to trace into the vessel's body 
a poem full of fire. Bonfire light flickering in and out calls to mind over the shallows of McCormick Fishing River, fireflies sparking about. The first word, kagaribi, refers to fires that were lit in metal cages and hung and used as lanterns, or as more commonly found in poetry, fire baskets suspended at the prows of fishing boats. These were used with cormorant birds tethered to the boats who would dive for the fish lured to the river's surface by the torchlight. Countless poems like Dengetsu's have linked bonfires and cormorant fishing, but the caged flames of Kagaribi of the fires also become a metaphor for barely contained simmering passions as in poems in the love section of the ancient anthology Kokinshu and in the poetry of the chapter entitled Kagaribi in the tale of Genji. In Dengetsu's poem, she describes not the flame itself, but its reflection, kage, which breaks up kudaraku, or flickers on the surface of the water. Kage, reflection, refers to both light and dark, and here it works with flickering to evoke light dancing on the water's surface. The relationship between the poem and the vessel complements the function of the object and might be simply characterized as clever. In Dengetsu's oeuvre, lighthearted poems about sake, for example, are often matched with sake decanters and sake cups. There is a humor and ebullience to her object verse pairings that is undeniable, even satisfyingly predictable. They were keyed to cultural conversations among those who touched and used these objects in prescribed social settings. In addition to a general register of humor and lightheartedness, however, Nengitsu's poems, especially when they merge with ceramic material bodies, embed possibilities for additional readings tied to aesthetic, political, or even religious concerns. In this poem, the description of the flame's reflection is not meant to offer objective scenic capture, but rather following certain poetic dictates of Nengitsu's day it communicates the perception of a scene by the speaker of the poem. Then Getsu does this by explicitly using the phrase calls to mind, kokochiste, at the end of the first stanza, making clear the subjective experience that continues into the second stanza. The poet likens what she sees in the flickering flame over the water to the experience of viewing fireflies flitting over the lower reaches of a river. Despite its brevity, temporality inheres in the waka, for example, the nature of the flame that starts the poem is only revealed toward the end of the verse through the inclusion of the cormorant river. Entirely new registers of temporality, spatiality, the inclusion of um, a meaning and experience emerge when the poem is inscribed into the vessel and held and used. And now I'd like to turn to the issue of Dengetsu's inscriptions and what can be called her kind of haptic poetics to consider the unique kind of materialism and embodiment in Dengetsu's work, a reciprocal embodiment that involves whoever encounters it. Dengetsu's ceramics prompt an engagement that can cause a kind of physical surrender or submission, a relinquishing of the self to the object suggestive of an intersubjectivity compatible with Buddhist notions of non-dualism. We can begin thinking about her ceramics in this way with a sake bottle, a to tokuri and cup that could be used on any number of occasions at the start of a sencha ceremony for a celebra celebratory toast, for example. On many of the small sake cups accompanying these bottles, one finds inscriptions that are felicitous in nature. These are ceramics appropriate for use in marking special occasions, and for that reason, have auspicious poetic verses on them. So for example, in the small cup, it bears the poem, the young crane's timeless voice heard through the ages. It sings of an imperial reign that lasts for a thousand generations. The poem alludes to the longevity of an imperial reign, but also 
longevity in general for those who would experience life and whose descendants would experience life through the temporality of an imperial dynastic time. Um, and here you can see how the poem has to be turned to be read with the young cranes here, that phrase inscribed in the interior and the rest of the poem on the outside. And then on the sake bottle, there is this interesting poem, an old tanuki foraging for sake. Perhaps this is how he passes the leisure hours on a rainy night. I've included the part of the verse that you can see on the bottle in the photo in what you can't see bracketed in red. The inscribed ceramic is haptic in the sense that it does not simply engage the user with the sense of touch. It involves a, more than a passive reception of feeling or a momentary tactile experience of the object. Interaction with it involves movement through space and time, a kinesthetic, because it is necessary to move the object to perceive it in its to totality. Any object, any ceramic object held in the hands already does this to a certain extent. But when a waka plume is placed on the object in this way, it must be turned for the entire poem to be revealed. The words guide one through the kinesthetic experience of the work and the vessel orchestrates the movements of the holder. And neither do the words exist isolated from space and time. The partial revelations of the poem are perceived and read in conjunction with other sensory information received from the texture and the physical material of the object. We can imagine moving our fingers over the surface to sense the depth of the incision that has been made. Let's explore a little further the symbiotic or a relationship between calligrapher, potter, vessel, and the later user. Take, for example, how the user processes sensory information based on the perceived tactile qualities of the vessel and then adjusts the body. When through touch one perceives a fragile, delicate object, for example, information is sent to the brain through nerve fibers connected to receptors in the hand that send signals to the central nervous system and the grip adjusts so that one handles the object lightly, differently, in an act of mind-body non-dualism. A thin-walled, seemingly fragile vessel could be described in stereotypically gendered terms as dainty, frail, feminine. These are, in fact, terms applied to women's art of the past. But it is possible to use a different vocabulary in describing these works. In terms of haptic dynamics, Van Getsu ceramics wield a certain power over the user, eliciting a bodily mimesis demanding a light touch. They insist in their materiality on a gentle approach, if only for a moment. The vessel, its materiality, can provoke a reaction of humility, a conformity to mutual physical estates. It might therefore align with Rengetsu's sense of working with moral purpose, with her identity as a Buddhist nun or a person immersed in a Buddhist worldview. Shifting gears a little bit, I'd like to follow up and begin um, concluding the lecture with an example from far from Japan, 19th century America, United States, and Emily Dickinson. In the same way that Dengetsu's poems and their meter should only be understood in conjunction with the shape of the object in which they are inscribed, so too are some of Emily Dickinson's well-known and envelope poems being examined in a similar way. And here you can see a stunning poem or poetic fragment in the short life that only merely lasts an hour, how much, how little is within our power. This is from a group of, a subgroup of envelope poems written on seals or flaps and as the scholar Marta Werner has described in her essay on the envelope poems, the tiny scale and luminous properties of the seal link it to the world of the miniature, to the keepsake or amulet. In writing, the seal is the ideal container for the aphorism. 
Only a few lines long, the poems inscribed over seals bear witness to the evanescence of existence, brief as a single day. Saved against all odds, unsealed for all the world to see, they carry Dickinson's last exorbitant message and her final canceled caution against doubt, uh, unquote, of, from the Werner article. For Emily Dickinson, it seems, her tiny my, miniature poems on fragments of envelopes could open up onto a world that included philosophical questions about the ephem ephemerality of life. For Dickinson, poetry was a matter of life and death. And it's interesting to view her, the shape of the materials that gave additional form to her poetry. She has this in common, of course, with Dengetsu. And Dengetsu also, um, and Dengetsu at, towards the end of her life, as was common to do, um, especially for a Buddhist nun, composed some death poems, and which are also important to think about in terms of ideas about poetic meter and material substrates. Here is one of her death verses, which she modeled on one by the poet monk Saigyo. And it is, in, it is the lower verse and it says, how I pray in the next world to be seated upon a lotus flower, a cloudless moon beheld above. Interestingly, at the time of her death in 1875, Dengetsu had been a nun at that point for over 50 years. Um, she, chained, um, she composed the death poem and she inscribed it on at least uh, one scroll. Here is a, a scroll that unfortunately has been lost, but this is a reproduction from um, a book. And her poem was inscribed between an image of the moon above and a self-portrait below. She portrays herself wearing the dark robes of a nun and seemingly with a walking stick in hand, an image of the peripatetic traveler like Saigyo, for example. In the context of the death poem, the journey captured on the painting can only be interpreted as a spiritual one. The composition of Rangetsu's self-portrait with the poem sitting between two pictorial images is intriguing because it prefigures the creation of her death shroud, which is described in a remarkable anecdote recounted by the artist Tomioka Tessai, who was her protege from the time of his youth. He recounts how, when Dengetsu was in her 70s, she asked Tessai to paint her namesake imagery of lotus flower and moon on a white cotton cloth she had made herself. She folded up the cloth, put it away, and Tessai soon forgot about the episode. When Denketsu passed away at the age of 85, Tessai realized that the woman, women of the village washed her body and then had wrapped it in that very cloth that he had painted on. Beholding her enshrouded body, Tessai realized that between the images of the lotus and moon that he himself had rendered years earlier, Dengetsu had inscribed her death verse. Unbeknownst to Tessai, Dengetsu had quietly orchestrated one collaboration between herself and her younger student, of which there had been many. Between Tessai's lotus and moon pictures, Dengetsu brushed the poem <clears throat> that imagines herself after death between the lotus and moon. She graphically represented herself through the Buddhist name she had taken and um, poetically, graphically, and pictorially, Rengetsu rehearsed the negation and subsequent rebirth of the self. And she did so in this literal act of embodied inscription, one the most literal act of embodied inscription she had ever performed using her own body covered in the shroud as a vehicle for her waka. We might ask, how in this instance did the shape of the shroud, the body it enclosed, check the rhythm of the poem. Thank you for your attention. Um, Adriana Proser, Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Quincy Scott, Curator of Asian Art and um, the Curatorial Chair at the Museum. And as we ponder um, those very poignant um, thoughts and, and um, stories about Rengetsu, um, I'd like to open the floor to questions or, or comments. 
Um, so if any of you have any, please do um, enter them into the chat. Uh, maybe I'll start us off. I mean, I'm thinking about so many things um, that um, come to mind with, with this talk you've given. And maybe um, I, I was wondering if for our audience, you could talk a little bit about um, uh, the drinking of steep tea in Japan. And I know um, many people in our audience may be familiar with um, the drinking of powdered tea and the um, the gatherings that relate to that. Could you talk a little bit about, Melissa, about um, the drinking of steep tea in Japan um, in uh, in Getsu's time and and the relationship between um, between the um, tea objects and um, those who are preparing and those who are drinking tea? Sure. Um, as I mentioned, it was a less formal environment for drinking tea than I think one might imagine the tea ceremony of Chanoyu today, um, where there seems to be, at least at certain parts of those gatherings, more silence, uh, silent contemplation. And with Sencha, it was more of a kind of vibrant salon and the vessels were in many ways smaller, the teacups were small, and so the, the water would be boiled on a brazier and then it would be poured into a separate teapot where the leaves would be steeped. And then they would be poured much smaller and then they would be poured into small individual teacups. So this is very different than the sometimes communal drinking out of larger tea bowls and chanoyu. And it was an environment in which all things Chinese could be appreciated if one had a collection of Chinese scholars' rocks, of Chinese paintings, of Chinese literature. It was the time and place to bring it out. Um, and so these ceramics were very much a part of this total environment, our kind of artistic environment. And it's interesting to think about how Dengetsu's poetry inscribed teapots and cups and so forth were welcomed into this Sinitic environment, bearing the Japanese verses that they did, coming from a very different tradition. They must have stood out quite a bit, and they were stood in visual contrast to some of those highly refined porcelains, for example, that I showed at the beginning of the lecture, with their really insistence on the handmade, on the vessels that have the fingerprints on them that really kind of announce the presence of, of the, the potter's body in them. And it's, I like to think of, even if she wasn't in these sencha gatherings, right, her voice was there because her voice, her poems were always her own verses. And so it was almost as though she was kind of in the tea ceremony or the sencha room, the tea ceremony, wherever her ceramics were, they were kind of surrogate voices for her. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, there's another question here from um, my colleague, Dani Chan, and she is asking, do you know whether Rengetsu planned her poetry before the ceramic was made, or did she work within the con constraints of the finished form? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's hard to know e exactly, but I think you can take clues or cues from the way just sort of the body of the work and um, kind of how the examples um, conform to each other or not. Um, I think that she did this for so long, for so many years, that at some point it no doubt became second nature. Um, I think it's probably unlikely that there was that much planning needed because she became such an incredible expert in this. And perhaps one thing I didn't quite point out enough in the, even in the example of the um, Walter's teapot, um, is just the minute size of that teapot and the, her ability to write such a legible inscription on such tiny little vessels and sometimes on such thin walled vessels. And um, so I think it's probably, we, maybe should imagine going back and forth between sometimes some planning ahead, 
sometimes doing something from her sheer amount of expertise and skill accumulated over decades. Um, and that every pot might be a little bit different in that regard. I also need to point out that I was calling the Walter's teapot a Dengetsu style vessel because it's very likely, as the scholar Lee Johnson pointed out, that it was made not by Dengetsu herself, but by her assistant, Kuroda Koryo, who after her death took the name Dengetsu II. That means that he produced ceramics in her lineage using her name. And there are many letters that survive between the two of them where she actually talks about him making ceramics for her. Sometimes he would form the base often using a mold like you see in the Walter's vessel. And then she would inscribe the, um, <clears throat> the surface. So um, this one, it's not entirely clear whether or not she inscribed the surface or in fact, if Kuroda did the entire vessel, which might be likely, he did stamp his pots for her at some point um, in his career. And so though that's clear that he did them. This one does not have a stamp bearing his name. And so um, it's a bit of a question, but that is, um, it shows also the degree to which her works were in demand and how many people wanted to emulate them. Thank you. We have another question here from Bryant T. Uh, and he asks, what was the Buddhist name that Otagaki Rengetsu went by? How prolific was she with po poetry slash pottery? And how often were they independent from one or from one another? So three questions in one okay. for you. <laughs> um, so when she was born, uh, when she was adopted by the Otagaki family, her first name was Nobu. And so she would have been Otagaki Nobu. And then when she took the Buddhist tonsure, that's when she received the Buddhist name of just Bengetsu. Um, uh, of course, she continued to use her last name, but she signed her pottery as Bengetsu using the Buddhist name. Um, yes. Um, the second part of that was how prolific was she with po poetry slash pottery? Astoundingly <laughs> prolific. Um, and that's borne out by the number of pieces of hers that are um, in collections around the world. Um, you know, thinking about that comparison between Nengitsu and Emily Dickinson. I mean, Emily Dickinson died at the age of 55. Dengitsu died at the age of 84, 85. Um, she had three more decades <laughs> of activity um, and she was um, very active in making these pots and she made them to make a living, to earn a living. So as I showed, you know, she didn't have much of a way to earn a living after her father died. She had to leave Chionin this was how she did it. She sold her works. But in addition to pottery, as I showed as well, there were a huge amount of other objects on which she inscribed her poetry um, that were also ones that she gave out freely sometimes, but also sold. Um, and a number that she did in collaboration with other artists. So she really is one of the most prolific artists of, especially female artists of her day. Um, and the end part of that was how often were they independent from one another? In other words, um, the, the poetry and the pottery. So was she making pots without poems and poems without pots? A poem without a pot. I've seen only one. And that was one that was um, dug up at an archeological site where um, in a location where she used to live. Um, and so it seems to have been refuse, right? She seems to have, although for the ones that survive, for those, there's a uh, kind of selection process there, they have poems on them for the most part. Um, and so she, in fact, presented the selling point of her, of her pottery to be the fact and her works that they bore her original compositions. So it's interesting because the poems, they do have a life of their own in the printed poetic anthologies. 
that I showed, so they were in circulation. That's interesting too, because you can imagine that when people purchased or received these pots, they might have already known the poems. They might have already been, you know, had them in mind. And so in the reading process of any work that's inscribed by her, there's a certain amount of projection by the reader who's anticipating the words that are already known. Um, and it should also be noted in the 19th century still in Japan, there was a kind of semantic web of poetry that was kind of cast over the entire elite society where poetry was such an essential part of communicating and of participating in these kind of cultural <clears throat> events um, that uh, it just kind of infiltrated all parts of life. Thank you so much. I have, um, I, I don't know if there are any other questions. I have maybe one more, and then if there's anything after that, we'll see. Um, but my, my question, and it's, it's, it's hard for me to look at, at a pot like this one that you have up on the screen right now and not think about Chinese Yixing teapots, um, which um, are also, for those of you who are, do, are familiar with them, diminutive in size and often have poetry inscribed on them or inscriptions on them as sort of part of the part of the aesthetic design, right? I mean, Rengetsu obviously um, is unique um, and very different from that in that she's using waka poetry, um, which is which is a Japanese you know, a Japanese form, which the Chinese, of course, were not using. But do we know anything about um, her knowledge of exposure to Yixing teapots? And, you know, I'm just sort of wondering because many Yixing teapot makers were also female. Um, it, it just seems like, a, I don't know whether that's um, coincidence or there's any relationship there. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I think if there was, uh, if they were in the cultural environment in Kyoto in the 19th century, she would certainly be in a position to have to have known them, and um, and certainly, I do think something that hasn't been emphasized enough is the kind of Chinese sencha kind of origins of some of the forms of her pots and how they might differ from them or show some kind of creative adaptation of them. That's, I think, super fascinating to explore, especially this aspect that you pointed out of the female makers, which I hadn't been aware of. Well, thank you. Um, I want to really, um, Melissa, thank you for this real, this deep and engaging look into Rengetsu's work. And I invite all our friends of Asian art and others to learn more about Asian art at the Walters on May 9th when histo art historian Stephanie Porras of Tulane Uni University will speak on site at the Walters and online about uh, St. Michael, um, the Archangel, Ivory Manila, and the Early Modern Globe. And also on May 25th, come and celebrate Asian American and Pacific Islander Month at the Walters with an afternoon of games from the Asian diaspora. Space is limited and participation will be granted on a first come, first serve basis. Um, for these and other upcoming programming, including artist talks, curatorial lectures, performances, and more, please visit our website at uh, thewalters.org. And a big thank you to our digital production, our digital team for producing this program. Massive thanks um, to our um, for, to our translators, and also especially to you, our audience, for sharing this experience with us. Thanks again, Melissa, um, and to John and Barrett Ford for supporting this annual lecture series. Goodbye.